working hard to achieve four goals at the same time. The first is to make the very best biochar. The second is to use as much of the process energy as possible. The third is to eliminate as many emissions as possible. And the fourth is to make the whole process as profitable as possible for everyone. we put in, we get out carbon. This is how we really mean to take a bite out of our carbon footprint. Good stuff. So both me and Bob back around 2005 uh, were scouring the planet for um, where do, you, where do you get one of these machines? You know, you got a lot of companies with, uh, we called it desktop machines. You know, they're, oh, this great design and all these patents and we're gonna do all this stuff, but where's the machine? You know, and, and where's the machine that's supposed to be scaled down that we keep hearing about? We couldn't find them. I was, I was talking to companies in France and uh, a few here in the US and Bob at a certain point got tired of looking for machines and decided to go build his. And uh, where he is on Cape Cod, it's, it's very high-end property all around him. He's, he's a little farm, kind of closed in, so he can't have smoke or some neighbors will be showing up. He wanted to burn as clean as possible, you know, uh, the least amount of heat loss and the least amount of smoke going into the air. And so when I, when I met Bob and he had just built his... Uh, his machine, which was about one third of one of these, basically one retort, one gasifier. Uh, I, was, I was real impressed to see that he had a condenser already because he was like, you can't have smoke you know, bothering the neighbors. So he was like, let's start condensing these things. The last bit of smoke gets condensed. We're burning probably as clean or cleaner than propane the way we're doing it. And that's because we pull these condense, condensables out. And, Maybe you could tell a little bit about your design, how you came to this size condenser. <laughs> Kept trying, I guess. <laughs> um, it started out, we were doing the single batch retort like John was describing, and uh, I had actually sold one to my first customer, and there was a big demonstration to come and see it, and it was putting out of the stack in the first portion of the burn, you put out the steam. You're driving off the water. And so there's this big cloud coming out of the stack. And that big cloud has a little bit of smoke in it. So this huge cloud's coming out of the stack. And we're telling everybody, don't worry about that, that's just steam. And then the cloud sort of drifts down over the crowd and everybody runs because you don't want to stand in it. And it smells like smoke and it looks like smoke. And I realized at that point, it doesn't matter that it's 99% steam. Yeah. It looks like smoke, it smells like smoke. Nobody's gonna want it in their neighborhood. They're not gonna let you get away with it. So I went home after that demonstration and figured I, I know I can build a condenser. Uh, so I took a couple of drums and built some manifolds, encased it all in a couple more drums and uh, silver soldered the whole thing together stuck it on my experimental retort at home, which we call the mule, which is basically one of those units that's been torn apart and put back together a dozen times by now. And uh, we fired it up and I couldn't believe how well it worked. It, it really surprised me. I figured I was gonna have to build that condenser over and over and over to get the, to get the specs right. But I, I guessed right the first time on that one and it's almost identical to the size and shape of the one that we're using here. And it works really well. It takes the gases that are coming out of that retort and cools them by running them across a gazillion tubes inside of that shiny can back there. And as it does that, they cool off and that all condenses and drips down to the bottom, runs off into a, a line on the bottom, which runs through the building off into these totes down here so we don't even have to use a pump was the 
was the challenge. That's why we built it below ground. Um, trying to pump those liquids can be a challenge. As you can see by the heaviest fraction, that's actually liquid. <laughs> that's the tar that ends up on the bottom when we separate out the condensate. So it goes into these totes. We leave it for about three months sitting, at least three months, and it separates out into this on the bottom, which we can use for paving. We can actually make carbon negative driveways for everybody if we get enough of this. We don't have enough yet. We're getting there. Then we get the, uh, the middle coming up from the bottom. That's the heavy stuff. The middle is the um, liquid smoke, which is a little bit lighter. This is actually pretty thick. Usually it looks sort of like beer. You can see through it. Um, we call it wood vinegar. That has an enormous number of uses, which are too many to even go into right now, but if people are interested, we can talk more about that later. And then the, uh, the light oil, which sits on top, which is what's burning in this lamp, just to show you how easily we can burn that and how clean it burns, that's practically a diesel quality oil coming at that point. Or I wouldn't at all hesitate to run that through a, um, a house oil burner. We don't get very much of that. It's a very small layer on top, but those are the fractions that we're coming up with. The, th the cool thing about it is, if you think about the expansion ratios, every one of those containers is worth about 1,700 times that much smoke in the air, if it were smoke. So that's one of the big things that I'm really happy about with this system, is how clean we can be. And that's one of the things that you've really got to hit for the regulators, of course. The EPA is pretty tough about those things and they've got tougher and tougher laws all the time. And the people that are interpreting those laws don't want to give you permission to do anything that's out of the ordinary. And this is very out of the ordinary. So a big struggle in my life is dealing with state agencies that are trying to interpret the EPA numbers to apply them to something that doesn't exist on their lists of this is what you do over here for this much of that and they come with all these calculations on how much uh, smoke you're allowed to put out if you're making charcoal and I just and I laugh and I give them a tour and I convince them that this is not charcoal and charcoal production never uses a condenser and charcoal production never has a stack where you can't see smoke coming out of it this is something much different. And by the time I'm through talking to them, usually I've won them over. At least that's what happened in this state. I've been through a number of states now, and some of them are very cooperative, and some of them are just don't care. They want to cover their behinds and won't say yes to anything until you've got a hundred engineers behind you that can prove that you're below their numbers. So the particulates, the um, there's a whole string of of compounds that we're not allowed to put out in a certain quantity. I designed this system to stay right underneath the regulatory levels of how much heat it can produce before you have to go to an, another big step of regulation. So we're right under that ceiling, which uh, saves me a lot of time in red tape, which would have made this another year-long process to put this place together if we just made a little bit more energy than we do now. Um, what else do I need to cover, guys? It's that machine. It's that machine. This? This is the unloader. If you didn't see that before. And we've got it open like the one on the end there. We roll this over right next to it. And there's a big hose right over there. This is nothing but a giant vacuum cleaner. And somebody hops inside with the end of the hose and sucks up all the char. The char comes flying up the hose, goes in here, hits this impeller, which breaks it up as it's going through. It also goes past the water nozzles here, so we're, we're getting it wet. That's to keep the dust down, mostly. 
but also to avoid any um, danger of explosion. Char dust can explode. You get a fine dust of anything, and blow it into the air and then ignite it and it turns into an explosion. Yep, so Abraham's showing us the, that's what it comes out like. After it hits that impeller, it goes from what you see in that box over there, when we add water to this. Now depending on what products we're making, we'll take it from that step to um, the trommel there. We can, we can divide it up into different particle sizes if we've got different products that require that, which we do. Uh, some people want big chunks, some people only want little chunks. If we're feeding it to chickens, we want them about that size. If we're using it for certain filters, um, biofilters and stuff, we want the bigger chunks. Um, if we're using it for tree mixes, we want them all. So we want that whole mixture. We don't need to necessarily separate it out. Um, from that point, we've got a mixer. We'll put in our other ingredients, our compost, worm castings, um, rock powders, whatever else we want to add to that particular product. That mixes it all up and then augers it over into the yellow machine over there, which is the, the bagging machine. So, um, again, depending on the product, it goes through all these different steps with different ingredients, gets bagged in a different bag, or in some cases we'll put it back to bulk bags if somebody's buying large quantities. Do you yes. anything in your process to open up the channels and increase the surface area of the char at all to increase uh, the, the well, just the surface area for the microbial content and all the stuff that you're putting in it? Uh, to increase well, our first goal is to make the best biochar that we can make. And that is regulated mostly by the temperature that we bring it up to. But also the rate at which we bring that up is important. Okay, so we're we're heating at a low, slow, steady rate and bringing it up, giving it lots of time to get those volatiles out and open up those pores. And we take it up to a very specific temperature. That's, that's part of our, our standard operating procedures is it has to get to a certain temperature. If it doesn't get to that temperature, using its own gas, we'll actually turn the gas fires back on and keep heating it until it gets up there. But again, one of the beauties of this particular system is it's balanced out really well so that as the stuff runs out of gas, as it runs out of volatiles, is right the point where it's hitting that 850 degrees Fahrenheit is our, is our mark. So it has to be between 850 and 900, somewhere in there, to, to qualify to go into the bag. If it doesn't, then we keep pushing it until it does. And that's... That's really a spec I've come up with by studying over the years the, the um, there's some conflicting information out there about what makes the best biochar. And what I have found is that there's, there's a point where, well when you're making biochar what you want is amorphous carbon in the end. And you heat the stuff up and get all the volatiles out you've basically got amorphous carbon, which, you know, on a microscopic level, it's like, it looks like a pile of dirt. It's a pile of fractions of pieces. It's like a pile of broken glass, black glass. If you keep heating it beyond that point, you start taking it up, say you get it up to uh, uh, 1,000, 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. What happens to that carbon starts crystallizing and all those fragments start connecting to each other as you're adding more energy and then if you add more energy the fragments flatten out into sheets they start to lay on top of each other and become graphite at that point now you've you've lost all those spaces that you want you've lost that surface area eventually you, you actually can get better adsorption at a higher temperature but it doesn't work as well for the microbes at the higher temperatures. So there's kind of a sweet spot that we've identified where we've got almost all the volatiles out, but we haven't gone so high that it's starting to collapse in on itself, and that's really what I believe is the best.
after studying it for 10 years with all my might and experimenting in my garden, in my farm, and getting all my other friends to experiment on their farms and doing professional field trials with universities and right up the line, you know, we've, we've refined what we believe is the best. I'm always open to hearing somebody tell me they found something else and refining that knowledge further. I'm not the I'm not the end all on this stuff. I know a lot, but there's a whole lot I don't know. You, you did the, you did design the system, right? Yes, yes, I designed and manufactured the system. Is there a model that you used to, to or this is like an original creation? Well, the original model was the Atom retort, which is a a masonry retort that is built in Africa out of mud bricks and it uses a single sheet of steel on the bottom for the heat exchange and Christopher Adam was the engineer who created that and he did it because he wanted to um, eliminate a lot of the pollution that people were standing around him and breathing all the time when they were making charcoal. This was charcoal fuel back then. He wasn't into biochar at that point. So a business partner in, in myself in New England bought the plans for his simple system, translated it into building it in steel, partly because we wanted to drag it around a trailer and show it to people. Hmm. And um, it's sort of evolved since then. We've, I've been trying to refine it further and further, make it more efficient, make it more, more safety built into it. Um, mostly more efficient and by having the three it, it really steps up the efficiency quite a bit. So uh, what Bob was talking about is a good segue into the applications. That's that's one of the uh, kind of expertises of this company is the applications of the biochar and I was going to go down and just show you some posters. There's a lot of stuff in the literature. Uh, I would say that uh, I still think there's there's a little too much hype in some places. The hype is running ahead of the actual trials. I got into it because it's the greatest carrier there is to, to provide concentrated biology to plants and to help them work more efficiently. So one of the test methods is the plants themselves, you know, to, to see what the... Uh, this is the final test. This is the final test. I mean, if they approve, we're good to go. If, if they tell us no, well, we got to go back to the drawing board. So I wanted to go over here to the wall where I got some of the stuff that's specific to what we did. There's a lot of people talking in generalities about biochar, but I wanted to show you some of the stuff that we've done specifically with our products, and some of it happened on Bob's farm last summer. So I think that's our next stage we'll go to.